welcome back to the Cambridge Union. Today we are welcoming Liv Garfield, who's the Chief Executive at Seven Trent, responsible for providing clean water and taking away wastewater to around 8 million people across the Midlands and Wales. Prior to this, she worked at British Telecom for 12 years. Her last role was at Chief Executive of Openreach, which is part of BT. She's also the British Business Ambassador for the Department of International Trade. But most importantly, she's an alumna of Murray Edwards College, Cambridge. So Liv, how was your experience at Cambridge? So I absolutely loved it, and I think I loved it partly because Cambridge is just that special feel, isn't it? You kind of fall in love with the whole place. I made amazing friends, and for me, that's what college life is about, is about becoming you, the you that you'll be almost for the rest of your life. You'll keep changing and morphing, but I think you at the end of university is principally you, and I found that Cambridge allowed me all of that and gave me a gazillion amazing memories. Wow, that's great. What would you say is probably the most important non-academic? So I think the most important non-academic lesson. So um, I'm bearing in mind my academics was mostly 16th century French, so that's not been terribly useful for my career. So my most important non, I think just the quality of friendships. So I made friends from loads of different colleges. I didn't just stick at Medwards in that sense, or Newhall as was then. And I think what I learned is that you need to be you every hour of the day. And when I arrived at Cambridge, I was quite nervous. I'd never been anywhere like an institution like this. And I came from quite a small town in Yorkshire, and this felt incredibly posh, old, and quite scary at times. And I actually learned that it's the people, not the institution, even though the institution is incredible, and people want authenticity, and people want to get to know you, and not to see some kind of version of you, but actually the real you. Speaking of authenticity, talk me through your journey from Cambridge um, through BT and now at Seven Trent. Um, what were the challenges you found in climbing up the ladder? Um, and what advice would you give to people just starting out their careers? So I don't think anybody has a career plan. So I know people sometimes say, oh, my career plan is X, Y, Z. I certainly didn't have a career plan. And so I started a graduate job because I wanted to do something interesting and engaging, and I found a fantastic company to start out. So I chose to go into consultancy. Accenture was fab for me, and it was great because I knew nothing. So I guess we're talking about, you know, when I was at university, there weren't even really computers, right? So I'd never really seen a computer. You handwrote your, lesser, your essays, your exams were done by handwritten. So, you know, to join a technology company with that level of non-technology meant that you had to join somewhere that was going to teach skills. So I started there, and I quickly realized that what I loved was working with people. I loved new clients. I loved new problems. I'm naturally curious. I love getting to know why, like why the problem doesn't work, what the source of it is. But I also love knowing why the psyche is of why people would want to do something that way and why would they not want it? And so I spent a few years there. I then realized that I loved Accenture, but you don't own anything. So you don't build anything, you don't deliver anything. And often you can give brilliant advice, or maybe I thought it was brilliant advice, you can give brilliant advice and your client can totally ignore it. So I realized actually, I want to go now work in industry and test out is my advice good or dreadful and actually run an organization and see how that works. So I did 12 years at BT. And that was amazing, absolutely incredible. That definitely changed my perspective on work and gave me a huge amount of new skills and insights. And then seven years ago, I left and joined Seven Trent. And that's each of those moves, they're huge wrenches, because I think I fall in love with places and people. For sure. Um, what would you say was the hardest part of moving um, from Accenture to BT and then BT to Seven Trent? So you're always going to go through the imposter th theory, aren't you, right? The whole imposter syndrome, which is you go through an interview and somebody gives you a job, you're probably amazed you've got the job, and then you're thinking, God, maybe they didn't see the real me. And then you have that gap of time between when you've been offered the role and when you join, and you begin to worry. So I think one of the hard things for certain is that phase of, am I actually going to be good at it when I get there? So I found that very unsettling in both those instances. Um, the second thing is, you want to be good and add value, don't you? Nobody wants to turn up to work and be average. And unfortunately, you are average for a distinct period of time in new roles. It's why I'm not a big advocate that people should change companies all the time, because to some extent, you need to learn enough and to add enough value in the company. So I think that I found quite unsettling. Again, that first 12 months of, you know, you don't know where things are, you can't get things done, you don't know who to call, you don't realize Bob's the man and you just need to call Bob, right? So whatever it is, I think that's quite weird. And then counterbalance that. I found meeting new people exhilarating. So I loved that. You've suddenly got a whole new colleague base to get to know and to learn from. And I found the fact that you've got a whole new industry to understand and to digest. I loved that. So I loved that going home at the end of an evening and your brain is fried because you've learned so much you almost can't take in more info. 
but I suppose I still have that sense of imposter syndrome. Am I good enough to do the role? Which I think is, is common and tricky. Yeah, for sure. Um, do, would you say that meeting new people helped you navigate that imposter syndrome? Or what advice would you give to people who are maybe tackling it while they're taking their exams, like most of our watchers on the live stream? So it's funny, isn't it? Exam pressure at Cambridge is one of the best lessons you'll ever learn. And it doesn't feel it now, I'm sure, but it is honestly brilliant. Because you almost need to get into essay crisis and exam crisis to realise what you do have within you, I think is part of it. You need to get used to deadlines, because work's full of them. And that's all work is really, to some extent, is self-generated deadlines or company-generated deadlines. And the more you can get into managing your workload, but also being getting perspective. And I think what Cambridge certainly did for me is, yes, people worked hard and crammed for exam season, but there was perspective. There were so many other incredible activities taking place the entire time that that was super helpful. And I think if you learn something from Cambridge, you should learn the mental models of where learning can go. You shouldn't limit yourself based on your degree course. It's broadly irrelevant. You've got an amazing degree from Cambridge. It doesn't matter what subject it was in. And from there, you can choose the world is literally a rooster. You've just got to believe. And I think Cambridge does naturally engender a lot of belief. People turn up all feeling a bit nervous that everyone else is brighter. And actually, over a decent period of time, you realise you're holding your own, right? You're swimming with a pretty impressive pack. And you're never going to swim with a pack as bright or as clever as your Cambridge year group. So thereafter, you have got a natural advantage in life. You spoke about deadlines and how work is just self-imposed deadlines. Is there a sort of a typical day as a CEO? So no, that's what's delicious about it. So I love my job. I don't think many people love their jobs in the world. Lots of people say, oh, I like this part of it. I love every single part of it. And I love the fact I've no idea what will happen. So part of my day is preset. I've got endless meetings or different things going on. But it's the unexpected that arrives, which is brilliant. So I love that. So no, there's no typical thing. You tend to create a typical week, though. So whilst there isn't a typical day and you can't predict necessarily what's going to happen, you know, there are a series of things, particularly in the chief exec role, where there is a cycle. There's like a cycle of life, a circle of situation where there's a series of board meetings, there's a series of visits, there's a cycle during the course of the financial year. So it becomes familiar. So even though it's never the same, it's almost like a familiarity. It's like a Cambridge term. So no term's the same. You might learn a different topic or a different subject, or you might do an entirely different course in some terms versus others. But actually, there is a familiarity, like putting on an old coat, that week one is different to week six, which is different to week eight, and you get used to that sense of it. I think work's a bit like that. And I tend to view careers as cycles of one years, because once you live the cycle of that job once, you've got a sense of the cycle, and then you live it again, and you get better and better and better, and then you're ready for the next challenge. And that's typically true at Cambridge, isn't it, right? You do a series of terms, and you get better and better and better. You're then ready for the joy of exams, and then you begin again, and you go through the same cycle again. It's not dissimilar. You said there was somewhat of a typical week. Um, could you talk us through what that typical week involves? Yeah, so, um, so I try to, the way I try to stretch my week, and everyone does it differently, right? There's no, that's the other thing to remember about work, there's no answer. So there's no thing that says, if you're chief exec, you must do X. The choice is that you do it in the way that you think is your style. So I try to spend two days a week out and about in the organization. So not, I guess, locked down in an office, but actually out seeing people. So I don't have all the best ideas. Of course I don't. No one person has all the best ideas. But I do know that the ideas exist in my organization. So all I really need to do is to listen to enough people, and they'll give me the best ideas. So I tried to spend two days out and about, across the patch, hanging out, listening to teams, talking to people, just spending quality time and learning how we can improve, what we can do next, what people are thinking, and how I can constantly help the culture. So two days of spending that. I spent probably a day a week doing, I guess, London-based stuff, whether it's investors, whether it's government, number 10, treasury, departmental stuff, journalists, interviews, whatever it is, there is always a day's worth of activity. And making that day only one day is the constant quest of life, is to limit that London external day to one day. And then I spent two days a week, actually, in our HQ in our main office, and a series of lots of Mondays and Tuesdays have lots of set meetings. So they're set broadly with, we run the rhythm of the company through those meetings, Mondays and Tuesdays. So typically, that's how I roll. For sure. Um, and you mentioned your leading style was lots and lots of listening to different people. Have you ever gotten flack for that, um, saying that you need to do this? Or how, how have you developed that leading style? So I don't think there is an answer as to how you should be a leader. I think it's got to be authentic to you. So for me, people spark ideas for me. So all my best ideas come from somebody I've met. And I'm not going to, you know, people say, oh, God, I just stand in the shower and amazing ideas come to me. 
they don't, right? That doesn't work for me. I need to meet people and chat to them, and they'll either they'll give me an idea or it'll spark something in my own brain that adds two and two together. So I think every leader has got to work out where they get inspiration from. I think every leader's got to work out the culture of the organization they want to create. And I think every leader's got to work out what's the necessary activities for that moment in their leadership time because when you're leading a company through a turnaround you would be doing very different activities if you're leading a company through a growth moment so i think to some extent your leadership style might be the same but your diary might look quite different and i think that's you've got to factor it into trying to say i will lead this way i think misses the fact that and um, they always say that if culture was to meet strategy then culture will outweigh strategy all the time and that's the reality you could write a brilliant hundred day plan before you began a job if it doesn't match the culture of the organization you're joining, your 100-day plan's doomed. Speaking of um, culture, sort of throwing a wrench into strategy, something that threw a wrench into everyone's lives was COVID. So how did you manage your teams when the pandemic first hit? So nobody knew how to run anything in a pandemic, I think is clear, isn't it? There's no, you've all got playbooks that say, we'll manage these things in these certain ways, but suddenly it is fresh and it is new. And what we chose is we chose that we were going to make some really big statements really early on, and we were going to stick to those. And the things we worried about is, first of all, how do we look after all of our people, from, but from a three-perspective situation? So from a physical well-being, how do we create a COVID-secure workplace? Because we are key workers. You need water, particularly in a pandemic, right? So we need everyone to go to work still. So that's the first thing, is how do we physically make people safe? The second thing is mentally. Very tricky, right? Lots of people suddenly thrown into a very different circumstance. Lots of people isolated living on their own. Lots of people quite nervous for elderly parents or for children that were ill. So suddenly that sense of how do you create that mental well-being protection? And the third thing is financially, is whilst we immediately said we'll furlough nobody, there'll be no redundancies and we'll look after our entire workforce so people didn't need to worry financially, if you're married to somebody else and they've not got that same situation, then suddenly you're bringing up those financial concerns to work. So we did a lot talking about, okay, tell us how you're feeling and tell us what's going on in your whole life, not just your seven trends experience, so we can best support you through that. So the first thing was that whole kind of like statement. We then made a series of statements that says, if that's our workforce, which is great, what do we provide for our customers? And what we said to our customers is we're going to make our service even better. So we're just going to, and we're going to try and find ways that as the roads are less busy, we'll do some of our digging up of roads during this period of time. And we'll try and find upsides that says service should be even better during this time. And that was really interesting. And then the third thing we looked at is we realized that in our patch in the Midlands, we suddenly became super conscious that charities had no money and suddenly lots of families had no food. And so we were able to step in and say, we'll make a million pounds immediately available in cash instantaneously to support food banks and homeless shelters in our region. And... We knew it was a good gift. Of course, that is an amazing gift for a company to give a million pounds. But we didn't realize quite how amazing it was because every other company was probably dealing with their own situation. And it ended up where charities, many food banks and many homeless shelters said the only actual cash they received during the first six to ten weeks of the crisis was the seven trap money because other money was promised and was coming, but it hadn't actually arrived in their bank account. And we were able to do that within literally seven days at the start of coronavirus. So I think we kind of viewed it in that sense. So some luck, some judgment, and I guess lots of listening to our, to our staff and saying, what else do you think we should be doing? That's absolutely amazing. Um, and that actually brings me to my next question about unexpected challenges. Um, you spoke a lot about how you deal with those as chief executive and then obviously during the pandemic. Um, is how do you generally deal with an unexpected challenge and what sorts of upsides have come from the pandemic? So perspective is an interesting thing, isn't it? So I think the 45-year-old Liv is probably better at dealing with unexpected challenges than maybe the 25-year-old. And I think as, as life gets older and life gets richer in terms of the sense of like you suddenly have this opportunity to learn from more people and that gives you a, a wider, richer sense of perspective, then I think you're able to take a beat to breath. So what I always say to people is the first thing with an unexpected challenge is understand it. Don't learn the top line and someone says X has happened. Really check you've really understood exactly what the unexpected challenge is. So ask enough questions to be sure that what you think is happening is happening. Um, the second thing is you need to get some different perspectives. So no big real challenge got solved by one brain. So the power of sharing a problem is amazing. The power of discussing a problem is fab. And that's why I understand the amazing advantages of the digital world. But I truly think if you've got a proper scale unexpected challenge, you almost probably need some people around the table brainstorming and saying, OK, what do you think we should do? I think that's why diversity is essential. If you've got the same people coming at it from the same perspective, looking at that unexpected challenge, 
you're not going to get your best answer. So gather a team of very different people with different experiences, with different contributions, and really mull it over. And I often say, you should debate a problem that's really hard for longer than anybody in the room wants to debate it. Because the first half hour you debate it, the obvious stuff comes out. If you debate it for half an hour longer than anybody really fancies debating it for, you might find in those last dying embers of the meeting something really good comes out because you've really chewed it and you've really gone through it. So one of the things I've learned with age is sometimes when problems are genuine problems, not every meeting, try and make every normal meeting as short as possible, but when you've got challenges and issues, debate it for longer than it feels natural. Yeah, that's really, really interesting and a great insight that I feel like as a debating society, we're definitely going to take. Um, you mentioned diversity. What does diversity mean to you? So for me, it's the widest possible sense. So it's different people from different backgrounds. It's different ages. It's different experiences. It's certainly the whole range of gender and ethnicity. It's a whole sense of every single person is bringing some different sense to the conversation. So we actively try and make sure that we have a really strong social mobility wide-reaching range across seven trends because the idea of taking everyone from one social class is clearly not diverse we actively make sure that we have a very balanced male female senior team across the top four grades of the organization we actively look for age range you know, differentiation as well because if you have everybody who happens to all be 40 well we're all going to think and be formed by the programs the tv the music the university experiences the life situations of what happened in our age group that's fundamentally different to suddenly having a whole gang of 20 year olds or a whole gang of 60 year olds so I genuinely believe you need full, the widest possible range, and likewise nationality. So I guess we can hear your accent gives us a bit of an international blend. And I think it's true, if we only take people from one region of one part of the world, you're not truly getting every culture. For sure, that's definitely a great insight. Um, speaking about diversity and gender balancing, your role made you the youngest female CEO of an FTSE 100 company. What would you say are the largest barriers to entry for women leading in the corporate world? So it's fascinating that it's still rare to have FTSE 100 female chief executives. So um, in my time, there were five the first year I joined the ranks, and then we went to seven briefly, which was quite exciting, then to six, then back down to five, unfortunately. And I'm fascinated by it in some sense because I can't quite comprehend that it's not accelerated. I think we've made amazing progress in the UK on boards. So when you look at non-executives, we now have most boards, have certainly all foot gender boards, I think now have at least one, and we're at 30% as an average across the piece. Certainly, Seven Trent, we're kind of like 58, 60% female. So in that sense, it is definitely possible. There is amazing female talent out there, so I don't believe it's a lack of female talent. I think part of it is footprints, is people need to see other people do roles maybe meet them, maybe was like touched them in that sense of like, okay, they seemed normal, maybe I can have a family, have a life, enjoy it, and also do that. So I think there's an element of footprints. And there's probably an element of we need more chairs to make bolder appointments. So I think it's what I find fascinating about the FTSE is not only aren't there many women, it's, it's a bit of an older sense as well. Like I'm 45 now, I was 37 when I was offered the job. And, you know, that feels very young now. And yet at the time, I, was, I think I was ready for it. So why aren't there more 37-year-old women being appointed into those types of roles? So I think it's a, we need more conscious diversity. For sure. Um, and rightfully so, you get asked this question a lot. Do you think the focus on gender is helpful for the general status of increasing diversity? Or would you say there are more factors that we need to be looking at? You mentioned age. Um, and do you think that focus is useful? If we'd made major progress and we now had 15 women as FTSE 100 chief execs, we'd be able to say we should begin to widen the range. The fact that we haven't means I think we simultaneously need to look at ethnicity and we need to look at gender. So I don't believe we should only look at gender. Um, but likewise, I do think we need to constantly talk about it because at least talking about it shines a light on it. And I think it is an uncomfortable reality that we don't have enough black chief execs, white or, um, uh, male or female, we don't have enough female chief execs of any age or colour. And I think when you cross compare it, that's not right because we should be, for me, representative society. 51% of people living in the UK are female. So by rights, unless we think that women aren't as bright as men or aren't as capable career wise, then broadly 51% should be female. For sure. Um, I want to change tack a little bit. You've spoken about how Seven Trent has a custodial duty to the environment. I just wanted to ask you what you felt like sustainability meant for you, both in an environmental sense and in any sense of the word. So I think it is the major debate of business of my time. 
And I think if we look at what success will be, how we'll be judged, I think, as a cohort of leaders, our contribution towards arresting climate change and making the planet more nature positive is I'm completely convinced what will be judged on over the next 10 years. So I've been passionate about this for the last few years. Um, Seven Trent will be net zero by 2030. We're nature positive. We're committed to continue to do a huge amount in that space. And it's not like that's easy for us. So we're actually one of the sectors which has very high emissions. We're in the top five emitting sectors for carbon in the UK. And yet the whole sector has committed that that's just not right. Let's go for a 2030 goal as a sector. We're the first sector globally to choose to do that. And I think that's amazing to take a sector that I think is look at, looked at sometimes as you know, maybe not the most exciting one versus SMG, CG or FS and to have chosen to be the leaders. I think it's fab. But I think it is genuinely the leadership imperative of our time. How do you navigate that conflict between providing the service to your customers and also feeling like you have a duty to the environment? Are there times when that's come into conflict? So leadership is about ands. So there's no day at the office when you're a leader, when you go in and say today is about culture and tomorrow is about commercials and Wednesday is about the environment and on Thursday I'll fit in diversity. It's just not like that. So the best companies have to be run on the basis that it's and, and, and. So yes, I expect my organization to deliver good commercial returns for our investors. That's what they expect from us. We are a commercial organization. Yes, I expect us to do that whilst progressing the diversity agenda each and every year. And yes, I expect us to do it whilst also making seismic change on climate change. So it's an and. But actually, who wants to go to a co work at a company where they focus on one of those dimensions? That's not actually that inspiring. So if you really want to win the talent war and you really want to have amazing people clamoring at the door to come and work for you, I think you have to be leaders on all of those. I don't want to work at a company that only thinks about diversity occasionally when it looks at its quotas. And I definitely don't want to work at a company that isn't focused on the climate. So I think the next generation will just continue to push even harder for chief executives to make this their cause. For sure. Um, that actually leads me quite well to my next question about you've spoken on the green recovery. So what do you think is next for companies in the next generation? So I think you can talk the talk and then you've got to walk the walk. And at the moment, the big focus is on making a commitment, isn't it, to actually as to when you're going to be net zero. And even then, lots of companies are still saying 2050, which is, you know, I mean, that's a life to work. You're multiple chief execs away if you're saying 2050. You've got to be going bolder than that. And I think now we're going to be judged on did you walk the walk. And I think over the next few years, it'll move from a debate of, have you made a commitment towards going next zero, towards, okay, what was your carbon emissions last year? And what's your carbon emissions this year? Are you year on year better? And have you got a plan that looks like it? you're doing each generation, each year, you're taking out your fair share of emissions? So the way I view it is between now and 2030, if you take those 10 years, okay, it's likely to be a bit more back end loaded because you've got some big stuff coming through, but you can't make no progress and then leave it all. You've got to begin to chip away at those emissions each and every year between now and 2030. And why don't you think some companies are doing that? So coronavirus has been tricky for some sectors, right? So there's no doubt that, and at the same time, it's also ended up where I think, I, I'm positive, right? I'm a glass half full, complete optimist. So my glass is not just half full, it's really full and it's over brimming, right? So in that sense, I believe, and I like to think that coronavirus will help us accelerate towards climate change. And I like to think that it's becoming increasingly uncomfortable to be a, a non-believer and a non-committed chief exec. So um, already nearly 40% of the FTSE 100 have committed to the race to zero. So that's fantastic. That's getting to cut to net zero by 2040 or better. And that's a huge step change from last year when it was only a handful. So I think we are seeing acceleration. I think for those that are left, there are probably some elements of chief execs that don't believe. I was hunker down and it's not my generation. I'll like, live through my time and I'll let the next team do it. There's probably an element of it. it is very, very hard in some sectors, and that requires more conversations around the boardroom on investment and on returns. So I think for differing reasons, but it will become, in the end, the sun and the, and the spotlight's going to be shone so firmly, I think everyone will move in the end. For sure. Um, why is water in particular so important for the sustainability reset? And tell me what Seven Trent is doing. So you can't live without water. It's fascinating, isn't it? So they reckon that there'll be civil unrest if you have no water for longer than three days. Whereas it turns out, you know, you go without broadband, you can manage without clothes. We had no shops, did we, for most of last year? So there's, it turns out we can even manage without pubs, right? So there's an awful lot of things we never realized we could actually manage without that we can, but you can't manage that water. And so we're, we're fundamental to three parts of the process, is that people's society can't live without it, number one. 
um, the supply chain of the, is the, our supply chain is the environment. So if you think about it, we take water from the environment, so whether it's rivers or whether it's reservoirs or how we capture it, then actually the quality of the air, the quality of the water that comes out the sky, the better that quality is, the less emissions, then the easier that product is to treat. So of course we should be heavily engaged in trying to have less carbon emissions. And then if you think about it, we place water back into society. So, you know, you know, river life wouldn't exist in the UK if we didn't make the effluent, the amazing quality we do, it goes back into rivers and it then helps the river quality. So across that whole piece, we're inextricably linked to that whole cycle. And yet what's interesting is we've never used more of the natural products than we do now. So I find it fascinating that we talk more about climate change, we talk more about sustainability, and yet the British public uses more of the resource each and every year. And we thought we'd stemmed that tired of it and then this year obviously the arrival of covid and less activities we now end up where people use 145 liters of water every day if you cross compare that to germany uh, they use 122 liters a day so actually quite profligate in the uk we do use a lot of water for sure um, I want to sort of change tax a little and talk about um, some of your accomplishments so you during a thaw that caused problems for the water industry you managed to ask businesses to ease up on their water use, and you also persuaded the BT board that a two and a half billion pound investment in broadband was right for a company undergoing heavy cost cutting. Those are some really amazing persuasive feats. If you could just talk through the audience through your process of persuasion and helping executives see something that might not be apparently obvious to them. I don't think work is any different to normal life, right? So if you're trying to persuade your family to do something or trying to persuade your friends, you know, some friends, they want the facts, don't they? They want the data and they want to know why should I do it and why is it good? And some people want the vision, don't they? They want the board it look like, right? If you want me to go on this holiday, what's it going to feel like and why am I going to love it? And I think work's the same. So some people, it's data orientated, show me a plan and I'll believe in it and I can see the data, I'll buy into the concept. For some people, it's show me a vision and get me excited about it. And for some people, it's help me along the path. So give me a no regrets first step and I can make that decision and I can move on from there. And so in each of those situations, I think if you're able to show customers data for something that moves them, if you're able to inspire them as to why, and that why is really fundamental, is it? So why should I care? Why should I do something different? I think that's essential. And if you can also show that you're in with something as well, I think um, leaders that look like they're telling other people to do something is very tricky long term because people turn up to work to be inspired by somebody they work with. And if somebody is trying to take you along the journey and it's a we, and we together collectively can do this, I think that's 10 times more inspiring than I think you should do this because I think it's a good idea. And how do you bring about that collective we? What sort of process do you use to really make people feel invested in that decision? So most people want to do something that's brilliant. Not many people turn up and say, I'd like to do an average improvement. So I think almost the more dramatic, the bold, the more audacious, the more ambitious, I think is part of the answer. So if you say to somebody, I'd like to improve service by 2%, that does not feel exciting. If you say instead, I'd like to do something wild, like roll out fiber to two thirds of the UK, somebody says, wow, I want to be part of that. That sounds incredible, right? Whereas if we'd done it to a thousand homes as a trial, I don't think we'd have got the same level of energy. So bold, audacious, ambitious. I think makes a big difference, number one. And then the second is communications. So nothing ever goes perfectly. There's no project in the world, there's no day at the office, there's no family holiday that ever goes brilliantly. There's always moments on it, but being really open, laughing about it and, and accepting that it is what it is, I think comms is essential. So taking people on that journey and allowing them to understand how it really is going, but also see progress, I think is really important. So people need to believe, we all need to believe, and on bad days, you need that belief twice as much. Incredibly optimistic. Um, I wanted to ask about the process of fibering the UK. What do you think was the most applicable lesson that you've learned from that very bold vision and that very bold process? So I think sometimes you've got to accept that if you, if you look forward, you've got to become really confident on trends that are going to happen for consumers. And every piece of data said to us at the time is that even though we had no retail customers, so BT Retail, Sky and Talk Talk, none of them were that confident they wanted to sell fiber. So on paper, we had no customers. Nonetheless, we were so sure in the strategy team and within OpenReach that every bit of consumer behavior looked like it was going to use more data. So video stream was just beginning, gaming online was just a concept, the ability of uploading photos, Facebook was launching, everything that was happening felt more data hungry. 
And it didn't feel like people wanted to do all of that at home. It felt like people wanted to be more mobile, more on the move, and more connected. And so it took a bold call that said, on the one hand, every customer of ours says, I don't think my customers want to spend more money for their broadband cost, but that's because they don't want to spend more for the same. But the ability to do something fundamentally different is a different proposition. And so it took a bold leap of faith that actually society knew what it wanted, possibly better than the providers providing at the time. So in that sense, the lesson I took from that is sometimes you've just got to basically bet the farm on something. And in that sense, it felt like every bit of long-term data indicated massive increase in data use. And that had to be invested in, and we were in the perfect place to do it. Wow, that's really, really cool. Um, my last question is asking about what would you say your greatest misconception about the business world was before you started? So I thought work might be a bit boring, to be honest. So, um, so when I was at college, I think lots of people really got excited about the jobs they were going to do, I'm going to do internships, I'm then going to do this, and they had brilliant career plans, and I had nothing like that. I worked in a fried chicken store on my second summer holiday, and, um, and then did a bit of traveling. So I was not in that kind of career kind of like focus that some of my colleagues and my, my peers were at Cambridge, and I think I thought work would be pleasant enough. I honestly didn't realize that if you genuinely find a company you love, and I've loved all three of mine, and if you genuinely take your best self to work and give it your all, then work is an addiction. It's like a, it's, it's a, an amazing opportunity to meet fascinating, brilliant people, but to make a difference, like genuinely, positively make a difference. And if you end up where you do then become in charge of a team, in charge of an area, there's nothing as satisfying as developing somebody's talent. Watching somebody do stuff they never realized they could do, finding potential, and effectively, genuinely changing their lives, somebody suddenly able to have a quality of life they never envisaged, or to be able to go and do a qualification they never thought they could, or to maybe just overcome confidence issues that they've never been able to break, that is honestly the most amazing, inspiring thing they'd experience. And so I love it. I love people leadership. That's why I do it, is I love new people. And I didn't understand that it would be that rewarding. For sure. Um, that actually brought me to another question about what have you felt like your favorite moment in your career has been? So I love all the random moments, right? So people always think I'll say fire bring two thirds of the UK and stuff like that, and not at all. So the thing I love more than anything else is I, I, t I take real passion every year in the annual engagement schools. So every year the whole organization comments on how they feel and I get myself a little bit nervous in the lead up to it. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you know, because this is like proper feedback on, on, it's all I do really as a chief exec. You only really do three things. You set the culture of the organization. You create an environment where everyone can be the best they can be and bring themselves to work. And you create the strategy that makes the organization successful for the long term. Other than that, you just communicate, communicate, communicate. And so every year, that feedback on how they feel about their work at Seven Trent and their belonging, whether they'd recommend it to other people, that is honestly, it's like, that's like my 360 every year. So my favorite moments is when you see massive step change, and I've seen huge step change in my time at um, Seven Trend, of how engaged and satisfied and genuinely happy people are. So I feel really proud about that. So I think that, and having that score last November, in the middle of a pandemic, watch it go up again, was incredible. On that note, I think we'll open it up to questions from our audience. If anyone has a question, just raise your hand and then wait for a microphone to get to you so that you can be heard on the live stream. In relation to your role as an ambassador to the Department of International Trade, I wanted to ask you um, what you think businesses or business leaders like yourself role is in combating protectionism and the populism that surrounds it and if you don't think businesses have a role to play in this what do you think the solution is to promote free trade gosh no easy questions in this forum so um so i think i genuinely think that you've got to accept that government sets policy best and business executes its vision best. So I don't believe the business is best placed to drive government policy as to how it should do free trade. I just don't think we are. I think there are brilliant, capable people in the civil service, like incredibly able people, and they're all to do that. I think what business has got to do is not grumble about the cards it's dealt, but make the best job of them. 
And on that basis, whatever is the backdrop, whether the, we like all the backdrops we have in the UK or not, our job then is to set forth and say, I'm going to steer this ship, I'm going to make this ship successful, because all these thousands of people work for me, and they require me to do a brilliant job. So I think that's the first part. The second thing then I think business has got to do is to be very honest. So not to cry wolf, but to be very, very clear on direct feedback to its department and to overall central government that says, here's my view. But it's got to accept its view will, is one input. It's no more than one input. And so you should make your view really clear, and then you should still crack on with steering your ship to the best possible opinion and to do a good job. So my sense is that, is that business has to make itself successful regardless of the context. My question will be a little bit easier for you. You! <laughs> um, so you're obviously faced with many different challenges every day from different groups and inside and outside work. How do you sort of prioritise and get your mindset into a place of what to tackle best? Um, and then my second question is, obviously, through your changes of careers, you've had to come to two options and two paths on whether to pick this one or that one. Again, what's the kind of mindset of, when you're delivered another opportunity, what to take? So I think on the second one first then, I mean, I always say to people, we often say, oh, do you have a mentor? And I think having an amazing mentor is great. And ideally, I think there is something invaluable about asking somebody else who's maybe lived the path a bit before you, helped you on that journey. So you are, you're the only person that can make your own decisions. That doesn't mean you're the only opinion that can help shape those decisions. So when I've got a moment to make a path journey, a decision, I'll often get loads of opinions. And best decisions are not based on grade. So, you know, I ask, I ask lots of different people of lots of different grades, what do you think to this particular thing? Because what you're looking for is a variety of opinion. And then at the end of the day, the buck does rest with you. At the end of the day, I have to make the right call for the organization or for where we're going to go next. But that doesn't mean I can't ask a load of opinions to help shape that opinion and then be really sure then once you've made it you've got to live with that decision so you've got to live and breathe it so what you can't have is indecision the most confusing thing for an organization is indecision at the top so i always say to people you know make good decisions but make them quickly and having made them don't expect to get all 10 correct so if you can get seven of your big 10 decisions correct you've had a complete result you'll still be fine at five so it, the most important thing is you made some calls and the organization was 100% clear that that was the direction they were going. Everyone was in on it. You were, spoke with conviction and you then delivered. Now, if you've obviously got it completely wrong, you also need to make the call that that is a rubbish decision and you need to have the humility and the vulnerability to be able to say, I made the call, I made it, I got it wrong and I won't do it again and here's what we're going to do next. So it's about being really open and honest and clear when you've got stuff wrong as well. On the first part, in terms of like, how do you balance? I mean, I think it's an interesting dilemma. There is never a perfect moment where everything is in balance, right? Life is, life is like that, isn't it? And it was like, I used to always laugh with friends when I was younger that, you know, there's like the five situations of, are you in good health? Are your family good? You know, are you happy with the other half? Do you feel as though you've get doing any exercise or any kind of sense of fitness and then is work good? And to be honest, that is no different. The only one you add on to that is you suddenly chuck kids into the mix as well. And the reality is it's a constant dilemma between all of those things. But if you end up where you drop one of those, so you're not a good enough, you know, I guess, daughter, sister, etc., then that's going to feel, you're going to feel in a pressure by not doing it. If you're not giving enough to work that you feel it's going well enough. So I think, I think it's one of these moments where at certain moments, work needs more from you and you have to explain that to the other parts of your life. And at certain moments, your kids, your husband or your mum or whatever needs more from you. And you have to explain that as well to work. And that's the best way is to be open. So share everything. And that feels awkward when you first begin a career. You don't feel comfortable sharing your home life. You want to almost act like the work you. Worst thing you can do, don't overshare. Don't give too much info, right? Give them just enough without being kind of like one of those weird nutters that has just overshared everything. But give a sense of it because the more you take all of you to, to work, the better. And the more that everyone can understand the context of why you've made that decision or come in early or left early or come in late or left late, so much better all around. Sorry, I have a follow-up question. That's really great advice. Who are your mentors you mentioned to go out to people? 
So there's a couple that I turn to quite a bit. So, um, so one is a lovely man called Stuart Chambers, and he was, he's been chair of a few companies, chair of Arm, chair of Rexham, he's chair of Anglo-American now, and he's just one of those absolutely delightful, highly engaging, but also wise people that has helped me make brilliant decisions at various moments, right? So he's fab. And the second I turn to is Ian Livingston. He was my old boss when I was at BT. I worked for him for a long time. I came back from maternity leave to work, you know, I guess, and he was, I inherited him as a boss. He inherited me as an employee. And we worked together brilliantly during quite a formative era, is that when you've suddenly got kids and you're balancing that return to work and life and how you feel about it all. And I worked for him for seven years and loved it. And I think he knows me at work. He knows my good days, my bad days, my slight over-exaggeration, my slight drama. He knows all of that, and I think that's great. Equally, I also talk to, you know, members of my team are also fantastic because, they, I guess, nobody knows you as well as your team. They've lived with you for years. So, again, I would turn to members of my team and say, all right, give me, give me advice. Did I just get that wildly wrong? So, again, I think it's a mixture of independent people that can give you perspective of probably walked the path before you, and then people who are very much in the context of the decision you're making, I do a mixture. So a mixture of people more junior than me, people, a mixture of people that have walked the path before me. Hiya. Um, I think I have two questions also. Um, firstly, if you were to find, like if you were at the board of your company and you had to find your replacement as a CEO, what would be the qualities you were looking for? I think you mentioned communication as an essential skill, but what would be the sort of what would be the job description skills, the, the qualifications you would be looking for? And the second question is, um, if your if your child came to you and asked an advice about a, about a possible career trajectory, what would be sort of the the minuses or the dark sides of the job? Some because you were overly optimistic about the about the job, but surely there must be something. Uh, some aspects of it when you don't uh, fancy it so much. Thanks. Brilliant questions again. So on the second one first. So, um, so being a chief exec, you've got to be resilient. And I th always say that um, the chief execs are not the brightest people in the world. So the FTSE 100 is not made up of the brightest 100 people in the UK by any stretch of the imagination. It's not made up by the most ambitious 100 people probably in the world either. It's made up by the people who are probably the most resilient. So in all of those companies, they probably just got back on the horse quicker than everybody else. And I think that's a real lesson in life, is resilience is something that takes work. So I think in the last 12 months have taught all of us that. You've got to be resilient to get through a COVID situation. Don't enter wanting to become a chief exec at any stage of your career unless you know that you've got brilliant resilience. You've got to have that mental, physical resilience. And I wake up every day like it's a fresh day. So I say to all my team, when the sun goes down, whatever happened yesterday is done. We're not going to talk about it again. We're not going to go back through it. We're not going to drag it over the coals and say, oh, my God, I'm so annoyed about that. It's done because the fresh day has to start. So really work on resilience. So for my children, I guess they're a bit young now to know. They're 11 and 13. We won't really know till we go for the test the next few years, I guess. But if I thought, then I'd say, I don't think there is a better job than industry. So I think if you think about going into some professional services, the, the lovely things about professional services, whether it's banking or law or um, financial services or whether it's um, consultancy, is you meet interesting, engaging, super bright, super able people every day. That's great. The negative of professional services is you are at the end of the food chain. Somebody else has the timeline. Some of the client chooses they want the work. And so you lose a bit of control of your life. The advantage of industry is that you deliver something, you own a thing, like you deliver a, a topic, a product, a thing, like in my case, water coming out the taps every day. Um, but also, you do get, I get more lifestyle balance than I suspect I would if I was a senior banker or a senior lawyer, because at least I know that if there is a deadline, there is an issue, I'm thinking, well, we're not going to do the call at 7 o'clock because I want to do bedtime for the kids, so we'll do the call at 8 o'clock, so at least that suits my life better. Somebody else is inheriting that decision. So I think that's the, the pros and cons are that, you know, You've got to be resilient to want to do it, but I don't think there is a, you know, thereafter, find a job you love. So the thing I would say to my children is, whatever job you love is the right job. And I love this job, which makes it the right job for me. If it made somebody else feel differently about it, it'd be the wrong job. Um, in terms of my successor, what a great question. So organizations would struggle if the culture of the next chief executive was too wildly different to the culture of the current one. So bearing in mind, culture will always outweigh strategy and outweigh talent. So the first thing is I am very warm, very warm by nature. I'm very engaged with the workforce. I'm very approachable. So I think there'll be quite important qualities. So you couldn't have somebody who's a cold introvert 
to follow me, who's been such a warm-hearted extrovert, it will be too big a seismic change, I believe, for an organisation. So it doesn't mean that you've got to have an extrovert, but somebody warm, I think, would be quite important based on the culture of Seven Trend. Um, I think somebody curious, I, I worry about chief execs that aren't curious, because it can go well for a while, but eventually you'll need to be more curious about what people are thinking, doing, saying, where's the next big challenge, technology coming from. So I think curiosity is essential at any grade. Um, and I think the third thing is that they've got to have a sense of the reason they want to do that job. So I would, I would hate the board to appoint somebody who just wanted to be a chief executive. Because again, that's not right. You need somebody who's got to have some affiliation. So they don't necessarily have to have worked in the sector, but they need some affiliation either to big infrastructure or to a real topic or to the environment. They need to have an affiliation to one part of the job that makes them the best chief executive for Seven Trent, not just a good FTSE 100 chief executive. First of all, thank you for the wonderful insights you've shared with us uh, today, Liv. Uh, my question is, at what point in your life or in your career did you realize that you're a good leader? Gosh, interesting. And, and it's hard because you always criticize yourself, right? So there's loads of stuff I would like to do better every day. Um, so probably when I was at Open Reach, and I realized that I had the opportunity to, make, to run things in a way that either I could run it to be fair, balanced, as in colleagues would love it, the company would do well enough, and at the same time, we could do fiber. And I think I realized that I was passionate about leadership at that stage. And the moment I realized it, I remember watching a TV program about redundancies in the armed forces. I remember feeling really sick that all these amazing soldiers that had gone and protected our nation were suddenly being made redundant en masse. And I'm not saying that was the wrong policy for government, I'm just saying I felt awful for these people that often lived on base, had their families there, didn't have other qualifications. And I worked out that we could probably do fibre investment differently, we could accelerate. So I took to the board an opportunity to accelerate our rollout. Uh, same overall cost, but done in a different format. And in, we could do it by hiring 1,400 forces people there and then. And I went and got an audience with the uh, head of the commanders of the chief of service and uh, for the armed forces and worked out a way that we could hire 1,400 people really quickly. And I remember thinking at that stage that that's obviously my passion. So whether I'm good at it, I'm good on some days, I'm dreadful on some days, same as everybody else, right? So I'm really clear that I'm only ever an average leader, we're all only ever average with an aspiration to get to be good. But I realized that my passion lay in leadership beyond all else. Thank you so much for coming today. So you've been at the head of like quite large telecommunications and water companies. So I was wondering what you think the role of the public sector should be relative to the private sector in order to maintain competition and give consumers what they really want, which is sort of uh, high quality, but also cheap services, and what you think the balance, again, between the public and private sector should be. Brilliant question. So. I think on the part of infrastructure where you genuinely can get brilliant competition, so for example, I guess um, in telecommunications, the part which is the in-house modems, the setup, the content, the merger between fiber, broadband, content, I guess phones, I think that is brilliant to be competitive. So I think, of course, having Sky bring the content, having BT bring some of the sports stuff they've brought in, having the merger between BT and EE, bringing those bundled packages between mobile and home line, that's created one of the most vibrant telecommunication markets in, in the world at prices, half the price of the US, for example. So I think there's definitely a role and a remit for where you've got, where you add value in that consumer end, you want competition. And that's probably true as well for energy. So where effectively you can buy the energy in, so the retail margin is a whole chunk of it is on the strategy of how you buy the energy. Again, it makes sense. I think where you've got a single infrastructure that actually goes into, whether it's the water that goes into the tap, you're never going to dual lay pipes, or the core backbone infrastructure of broadband, where to some extent, again, you're not going to dual lay multiple fiber networks. I think what you've then got to do is use the regulation to create the tenacity that consumers expect, and most importantly, the quality of service. And the single thing that people want is people want really good value, really good service. And the only reason it ever gets debated, this kind of like private public situation, is when people don't feel they're getting really good value. And I think at that moment in time, either regulation should get stricter or stronger, or we should look at that. But that's where my sense is, is if you're providing very good value, very high quality service, then monopolies are fine. But it is pushing hard to get that high value quality service.
follow up to that. What would be sort of one industry where you think that we're not getting the value or you know, the sort of price point and sort of what regulations you would uh, try to impose in order to really get to you know, a sort of socially optimal outcome? So the two where the debate, I think, is fiercest is in the rail networks, and I think that's probably acknowledged that we pay a lot of money for rail versus any other nation. And that feels expensive, doesn't it, right? And I think we struggle to think that we get good value. And I'm not saying that there's not a whole good load of reasons why investment's got to go in, but if we're going to try and get to carbon neutrality, people have to use the trains. And at the moment, it is far too cheap in many parts of the country. There either isn't the opportunity to travel by rail or by public transport, or the cost of it is preclusive and it is cheaper to own a car. We have to get cars off the road to manage the carbon situation for the future of the UK. So for both carbon and price point, rail is essential. And then I think there's been limited innovation in mail. So when you think about it, if you look at how cleverly Amazon can deliver endlessly within hours of any type of product, the fact you can't get one letter from one end of the country to the next pretty quickly feels tricky, doesn't it? Because you're not even choosing the color of it or, or, you know, or tailoring it or personalizing it. It's a physical document that's just got to be transported. So I think the two that I suspect the debate is trickiest is around mail because of not enough innovation and rail because of carbon and price. you sort of shape regulation in order to get more innovation or in order to deal with the carbon and pricing problems? So I think on rail, I would accept that government's got to play a bigger part of doing more investment in infrastructure and other nations feel more comfortable investing more in rail infrastructure. And I think we need to do the same in the UK. So I think we need to accept it, bite the bullet and say, to grow back better, greener, bolder following coronavirus, we need more ongoing rail infrastructure, I think is one thing. And I think on mail, we've got to take real learnings on the innovation that comes out of people like Amazon and say, okay, how do we get that level of innovation? And I think we should just be demanding that that is what the standards need to look like. So I think it's, you know, setting standards that feel right, I think is the answer. Thank you so much, everyone, for all of your questions. And thank you so much, Liv, for joining us um, this evening. Thank you for having me. Thank <laughs> you.